Hello, my name is Greg George, and I am an applications engineer here at Octon. Today, what I want to do is create a tutorial introducing Geomagic Freeform. So I often get asked to introduce people for the first time to Geomagic Freeform, not just on a presentation level, but to teach people how to get up and running and get started, like a quick getting started session with Freeform. And Freeform is a very special product in the way that it is, you'll see here in a few minutes, um, that it is a hybrid product where it's a piece of hardware and a piece of software that work together to make this amazing Freeform modeling software. And it can be a little bit challenging to kind of introduce this. So what I wanted to do is make a video that kind of covers all the basics as much as I can in one video moving pretty fast. I'm going to move fast, but this is a video so you can pause and go back if you need to. That way I can cram all these basics into one video. And the reason why I do that is this is kind of like your introduction. You download Freeform for the first time and you want to get started. You want to do something, right? Well, that's what this video is intended you to show you where all the buttons are, how to connect your haptic device, all of those other things, and then go from there. So I'll add other color commentary along the way as we go through this tutorial, but that's kind of the scope of what I wanted to do here. Other software is you can download a trial and go through a quick tutorial and get up and running and their paradigms and how they work very similar to other softwares. But this one has this other wrinkle of a haptic device, which puts it kind of in a category almost by itself because there are very few softwares out there that connect to these types of devices. Um, so let's just start from the top real quick just to make sure we're all on the same page. I figure out to put a little bit of this information in here. I'm not going to be, this isn't a sales pitch or anything, but I'm just going to talk about for people that may have clicked on this video that don't know that much about Freeform, that want to learn about it, we can talk about this first and then jump into the technical side. So what is Freeform? It's the industry's most comprehensive organic hybrid design software on the market. It enables you to solve complex precision design and manufacturing challenges and easily addresses challenging tasks within the scan to print uh, or CAD to manufacturing workflows. So really what I want to say about this, it's a very comprehensive toolbox of organic hybrid design tools on the market. A lot of people will call it the Swiss Army knife. It picks up where CAD leaves off. CAD does NURBS CAD modeling very well um, and prismatic stuff very well. But when we say organic and freeform, just like I have on screen, we mean really organic, like organic human beings and sculptures and all that kind of stuff. Now, you don't have to just model that, as you'll see here going forward, but you can do all kinds of other things. So this software is designed for highly comp complex precision designs, right? And really it revolves around actually making physical parts. So the best freeform workflows are ones where you're doing organic design, but creating physical parts, whether you're printing or manufacturing them. Yes, there are other softwares on the market that are very cost effective that create organic models but a lot of them have no units or tolerances and they have no mold tools or other things that you would need to take that design to the next level where you're actually going to create it freeform is an organic modeler that focuses on making physical parts the other element that i mentioned earlier is Freeform is also a modeling tool that works with a haptic device, which gives you a sense of touch in the digital world. So you're able to have more freedom of motion and a physical sensation while you are designing in this virtual environment. And it's a very intuitive way of interacting with 3D models um, and curves, and it speeds up the design for creating organic 
models inside of the 3D workspace. So you'll see that there's a little uh, picture here on screen of one of our haptic devices, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But as we move along, we'll discuss that. So in addition to that, Freeform supports all the basic uh, model formats to be able to bring all this information in. Whether you're designing from a blank screen, which you can do that in Freeform, or you're bringing in 3D scans from all these different types of scanners, CT scanners, all kinds of different workflows. You can bring that all in. So as I mentioned before, it's a hybrid product of having a physical device called a haptic device, which gives you, it's like a 3D mouse, as you see here in the video on screen, but it also has the ability of the touch sensation. So when you're holding that stylus and you move that stylus to touch the part inside of the software, you actually feel it. There's motors and encoders inside of this device that I'll, that stop it when it touches the surface. And it's something that I really can't describe adequately unless you get your hands on a touch device. So I understand the limitations of doing a video like this. Many of the people that are going to be watching this already understand this part and they're looking to get up and running. And for those people, you can jump forward in the video and jump into the tutorial section. But I really just wanted to show this. This is what I'm going to be working with throughout the entire video is a haptic device, right? So there are two types of haptic devices. The top one is our uh, Touch X, and that is our industrial version. This is for the version we have people in the manufacturing world and medical worlds using these things almost 24 seven. And that's what that top device is. It's our industrial one. It's the one that's made to be used all day, every day as a hardcore user, right? At the moment, that top device has one button on it. And this will make more sense as we go forward in here, but it has one button on that haptic where the person's hand is. And you can click that to use the different tools. And um, there are various different uh, types of connections that these devices have over the years. Uh, we've had SCSI parallel port, I believe, um, ethernet for a long time, we had ethernet connections. Then we also stuck USB Ethernet adapters on the Ethernet devices. We had Firewire versions of this device. And then now, going forward, we have USB versions. So if you are purchasing right now, you're going to get a USB version. But I mentioned the others just in case somebody has a parallel port version or a Firewire or an Ethernet, right? So I'm just going to bring those up that those exist. Um, now in the bottom, I'm going to scroll back and forward. So that video replays. And at the bottom, you see that's our regular touch. I say regular, but it's an awesome device. It's not, there's nothing regular about it. It is the, the lower cost, lower tier version. Now the, what you're sacrificing is you get uh, a little bit less haptic resolution, the hertz, the refresh rate is a little lower than the upper one. The other aspects is it's more mass produced. It's um, the upper one, we have the ability to fix almost anything on it. You know, it's a device that's made to be worked on. And again, it's an industrial one. The bottom one is if anything ever goes wrong with it, we essentially just replace it. We rarely have any failures on these things. These are great devices all the way around. I just bring that up. The bottom one has two buttons on it. Now, in the future, the Touch X at the top will have a second button. I've already seen the prototypes for it. It's just in testing and production now. So they will both eventually have two buttons, but I just bring that up now. If you own one now, the top haptic has one button, the bottom one has two. And usually what these buttons are used for is the one of them, the first button, 
uses the tool that you're in, as we will talk about a little bit later. The second button will actually switch over to the rotation translation mode, which is a nice shortcut to have. So that's one little advantage that this one has is that it has the second button already because it was designed later on than the first one. Now on the back of these devices, you have uh, connections as well. This one was made in Firewire, Ethernet, and USB just like the uh, Touch X there. And it also has that inkwell. So again, if I just kind of bump up and back down, you'll see that there's a little inkwell down at the bottom um, that when you're done with it, you can put the, the stylus in the inkwell. It has this home position. That's another little difference there. Um, that is used also to help kind of zero it out, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, so those are some of the things that are different differences between the two different devices. Now, I will point out there was a third device that was a very low cost um, product, um, production version that we had called the Touch Stylus, which is no longer in production, so we don't have it. It um, is a darker colored gray and looks a lot different than both of these. So if you see another one where the bottom, the entire base is a cylinder and it lights up, that one is no longer in production. It, if it is running and everything, it would still work with our software um, today, but we no longer produce those anymore. I just point that out just in case you've seen one and you have one on your desk and you're watching this video. That one does exist but we no longer produce that one anymore. Um, so we will continue on moving, talking about how to connect the devices. So what you're gonna need to do before you open Freeform, and this is very important to understand with how this software works. If you install Freeform with no haptic, you can open Freeform and it will ask you for a trial license or of your regular license. And if there's no haptic, it'll actually adjust the entire interface of Freeform to only tools that would work without a haptic, which is less than half of the tools in Freeform. Because again, the software was originally designed around having a haptic device and leveraging that tool. So lots of tools. There's like no other way to do what we're trying to do without a haptic. So what we do is we adjust the interface. So if you open the software and all you see is a sphere on screen as you move your mouse around, but no like handle on the sphere, it means that you're in mouse only mode. And that's really nice because if you are traveling and you don't have a haptic with you, you can still open freeform files and export and do all kinds of regular tasks that don't require a haptic. Um, but you're able to still open the files and work with them without a haptic. Now that also points you to the fact that you need to connect the haptic with the USB. That's the latest of how we do everything now is you connect with the USB into the computer, connect it to the back of the device. Now, if you happen to have an ethernet device, those are, there's still tons of those out there. Um, when you open that up, I'll go ahead and open up the touch driver. So it's understood that when you, when you download Freeform and install it, you also need to download the touch driver. So there is a separate touch driver that will automatically install when you run it. So there's two different installers, again, Freeform and the touch driver. And once you do that, you open it up like I just did here. And if you have the USB one, It'll go ahead and see the USB device. You can click on it and you can save the configuration and it will ask you to exercise the device. So you, it'll want you to move the haptic around. And the way I always instruct people to do it is grab the haptic and move it to the top left, bottom right, top right, bottom left, pull it straight back as far as it goes, push it underneath of the base, and then it is calibrated. That's for the Touch X. 
if you have the regular touch, you can essentially take the stylus out of the inkwell and put it back in, move it around and put it back in. Um, and that is how you will exercise the motors. Uh, if you've ever used the portable CMM, it's a similar idea. It's kind of referencing the encoders and stuff. And then when you're done, you hit this save configuration. And now it's connected to the computer. It's officially ready to go. And then you can open Freeform. So that is kind of your little introduction there. Now, if it doesn't see the haptic itself, then you need to check your connections, check your power, make sure everything's plugged in tight all the way, and retry, reopen the touch smart setup. Now, I'm going to go ahead and explain the, the Ethernet method real quick. It, if you have one of these touch devices, both the Touch and the Touch X had Ethernet versions, you could also connect the Ethernet to the computer to the back of the device. The only thing you would have to do there is you would have to click pair. And then you would click pair and then the software would sit here and do a countdown. And then you'd have to reach around to the back of the haptic device and on the Touch X on the back, up, up at on the top of this little cubby in the back, you, there's a little button that you press and it would sync with the software. And then the, the regular touch also had a little button on the back. So you would connect it in, you would hit pair, and then you would press the button and then it would pair with the device. Now, that's not the way it is. It's going to be going forward because everything should just be USB, but I just point that out in case somebody just happens to have one. We're in this weird time where some people still have the old devices. So that's enough about that. I think I've beat that topic. So now I'm gonna go ahead and open Freeform. And we will talk about the interface. So as you can see on the screen, when you open it up, the only difference between yours, or actually two differences between the way mine looks right now and the way, you, the way yours looks if you're opening up on your screen, is I have the palettes, the favorites palette dragged out on screen. And then my colors are different. And we'll talk about that here in a second. I like to change the colors and the preferences to the dark mode. Um, so you'll notice right away, very um, Adobe-esque, where we have these palettes, and then you can scroll these palettes on the left-hand side. There are some shortcuts that some people like. Like if you hold Alt and click on the palette header, it will collapse all the palettes or expand them all. I like that. That's a neat little uh, setting. You can click on the header of the palette and drag it out. And that's exactly what I did with the favorites here is you can click and drag the training guide palette. And if you're using certain ones all the time, like curves, the workflow you're using has a lot of a curve intensive stuff. You can just go ahead and drag these out. People do this all the time. And as you can see, the favorites palette is all the way out the bottom. I drag that out and that's what I have here. And in order to add to the favorites, you hold control. And if you hold control, you can drag a command to the favorites palette. And then if you, did I say control? I meant alt. So if you hold alt, you can drag it and then drag it off and it will remove it. Now, some of the ones that I definitely uh, add is the select curves. I put that in there. I know it seems redundant where it's right there, but if you're scrolling through, um, this is always on screen. Uh, the draw curve, this guy, I use it all the time. Create plane, shell cut. These are kind of the ones that we will use in this workflow that we're going to go through here in a little bit. But these are some of the ones that I like to use. So you can, those are palettes, right? You have, that's where a lot of commands are. The next area that you'll find commands in the software is under the menus. So anybody that's seen Windows in the past 20 years recognizes menus, right? This looks like Windows 3.1 right here, where you have these different menus and you can go through. So some key things, open, new, save, all those things, export. Um, we 
put our preferences or tools, you know, there's two different paradigms that exist in the world. Tools options, that's what we do here. File preferences is where some softwares put their stuff. But in our instance, we put our uh, settings of the software in tools options here. And that's, of course, where you can come in and you can adjust. For example, units would be a popular one. Come in and change the readout units, right? And then go from there. So tools options. All your palettes, you can turn them on and off from here. Your pieces. You have tons of different commands in here, and we will reference some of these later on. So that's the second place that you find tools. Now, when you're in a tool, regard depending on what tool you're in, as I have, as I click through some of these tools here, you'll notice down at the bottom we have this thing called a Dynabar, which this is very Adobe-esque as well, except Adobe puts their bar at the top. So it's like the settings of whatever command you're in and all the different options associated with it, which we'll get into more of that here in a minute. One thing about the Dynabar that's really neat is you can hit the click on the icon. It will take you, take you straight to the help of that specific command. So you see that was under smooth, but if I'm in the hot wax tool and I click on it, you'll see now I'm in, it takes me directly to the help for hot wax. Um, you can also hit F1 to adjust and go to help as well. That's another thing. Um, you can turn on the triad. You'll notice that, hey, this is a third difference between mine and yours, is the triad isn't showing by default unless something changed recently. But we call the coordinate system of the software the triad. So if I rotate this just so you can see it, that is the 3D coordinate system that we're in right now. In order to turn that on, you come over to View, Triad, and you can toggle that on. I recommend always having that on. The only time I turn it off is if I need to screenshot a model for somebody and I don't want this just kind of busying up the, the scene that I'm trying to send somebody, right? And then the other area you can find commands is over here in this object list. It used to be when we had older versions of the software that the object list wasn't showing by default. It should show by default unless something is different about your computer somehow, have a separate monitor or whatever, it should show. But if you have a, a weird configuration of monitors, the object list, if it doesn't show up, you can always come over to the view and then object list right down here at the bottom, or you can hit just the O key on your monitor and it will turn that on and off. I leave it on 100% of the time because I like having all the pieces showing and there are actually commands in here. So if I, if I click on the object, you'll see the icon, the picture next to the text, only this area if you click on it, you can access a bunch of commands like Boolean commands, a reposition piece. All these different commands are hidden under this little icon here. Now, a lot of them are redundant in other places. This is just a very convenient place to have them. So I say hidden, but it's, it's actually a very convenient menu that I use. So that's another place that commands can be uh, activated from is under here. So, so far we talked about menus, palettes, and the object list, and the Dynabar. Now, here's another one that some people love, some people don't, is the spacebar menu. So, you can hit the spacebar menu, and you'll see that I have customized this. In there, under the spacebar menu, I have put a couple common commands that I like to use that you know, maybe they're not in a palette and maybe they're in just different places. And this is one way that you can just throw almost anything in the software inside of this menu. Now, in order to do that, you would come over to customize. This is actually called the favorites list. That's what you customize. So if there was something else like construct clay, add clay, basic shapes, and I wanted to add that to the menu, I can hit add and you'll see it puts it here. I hit OK. Now, when I come in here, basic shapes is in there as well, right? 
I come over to customize. I could take that out if I wanted to. Now you can adjust your space ball settings. That's I have a 3D mouse connected to this as well. Um, you could add keyboard shortcuts in here. Keep in mind that we do have some shortcuts already built, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, you can uh, have palette filters where you turn on and off different palettes. Um, your favorites palette, you can you can customize it from here instead of doing it by dragging and dropping like I do. And then we even talk about training guides. You can add the training guides to that menu as well. Like if you wanted to customize the software yourself and say, I want to train only my employees with these guides, and then you could add that to this list too. I don't see people use that much, but it's really neat. This this favorites list is where most people spend their time in here. It's coming in to adjust that. So that's really handy is having that. And again, you can access the options from that favorites list. Instead of going to tools options, you can come over here, go to options that way. And then there was one other thing that were, I was thinking about talking about in here. training guides. We actually have these training guides in the install directory of the software. So C program files, um, 3D systems or Octane, depending on what install, the how old your installer is. And then under documentation, we have these guides. So if you need to open those, they're built right into the software. Now, as for the object list, one thing I did leave off is when you're on this object list, another thing that is neat is besides having rename, like you can rename your objects from here, you can add notes, um, you can add folders. And then you can put pieces in folders or put folders underneath pieces to hold curves and stuff because there can be like curves or things that are on this specific piece, right? And so you can add these folders in here and you can even make folders up here by clicking on the icon and saying, here's another folder and put this piece in that folder if you needed to. And you see here, I have a, a folder with a piece and then the piece has a folder on it. And you see there's lots of different options here. If I need to get rid of it, I can come over to delete. If I need to get rid of that, come over to delete. And before I do that, I can drag this back over by clicking on the text itself, back over to the initial folder, then come over and hit delete. Now, before I do that, one thing that we do sometimes on large projects is I'll just use these folders as a visual break. And I learned this from our product manager. I can copy and paste this folder So you, you can see here, I can drag this up there, put it under here. So I could have multiple pieces and folders kind of breaking up a project. Because sometimes they're like, these are my imported pieces. And you will discover that on large projects, this is very important to come in here and make sure you name things properly and say, hey, this is my imported part. And then this is my production piece. This is the brace. This is that. And I can organize everything and keep it set up. So I just want to point that out. Like I'm introducing the software in a way that people actually use it. Right. So I just want to make sure that I point that out. Another thing is Freeform has a few different little quirks. It's a software that was developed over many, many, many years. And there are certain paradigms that exist in here that may be different from another software that exists out in the marketplace. One of them is in order for the haptic to have touch feedback on a piece, it has to have an active piece. So you'll notice when I clicked on the icon, it says activate. I only have one piece in here right now. So whatever is in the workspace is activated automatic. But if I had multiple pieces, um, one of them has to be active in order for me to work on it and have my haptic 
activate on that object, right? Now, some tools can work on inactive objects, like if I'm Boolean this piece from something else, right? So the, the real activation aspect is really just putting the focus of the software on this main piece so that the haptic works on it. And then all of the other commands will work on whatever they're allowed to in that aspect. So basically you're allowing it to activate a certain piece one at a time. And I just point that out. Now, the other thing is it can't, it has to be showing a piece all the time. So watch what happens here. If I hit the button, it says one, there must be at least one piece shown. Show another piece before hitting this one. So you'll notice I actually have nothing on screen. This is an empty piece, right? So I can come over to pieces and say new piece and make another empty piece, right? And you see now I'm able to turn that one off. So the trick is when you create a new part, I'm just going to hit file new, not save this. I can say start with empty model. And it always puts an empty piece in there. And then you can import whatever else you want to later and then go from there. Now, as we create our first part here in a second, this will come into play where you have an empty piece. So if you don't have anything but one object on here, then you could just come over to pieces, new piece, and add an empty piece. And that way you can hide everything, right? So that's a long explanation just to describe something it, how this tool works. Now, before we jump in and utilize that knowledge that we just gained here, I'll point out one other little quirk. The software is always in a command, right? So when you open the software, it's under this carve with a uh, ball, carve with, I'll just roll over it again here, carve with ball. It's in that initially. So you see here that I have the haptic connected and carve with ball is active. This is what it opens up in. It's always in a command. So in order to get quote un, out of a command, that's why I have this select right here. To me, this select curve is the neutral state of the software where you're no longer in a command. And the reason why I bring this up is there are instances in the software where you need to get out of the command you're in to do something else. And in order to do that, you need to go back to this tool here. So there is a shortcut for that. The S key will get you back to select. So if I'm in, let's just come over to, here I am, I'm in the hot wax tool. If I hit the S key, you'll see that it switches over to select. So that is the shortcut to get out of the tool you're in and into the select tool, which in my opinion is like, it's like you're getting out of all the commands. That brings up another point. I never did tell you where the uh, hotkey glossary is. So if I bring that up, if I come over to hotkeys, you'll see this is where all of these are. So we will talk about navigation in just a second, but that is where the hotkey glossary is. It's under help and you hit it and it'll even give you some information there you see about shortcuts and, and things like that as well. So that pretty much summarizes the interface. Well, with the exception of one last little thing, I talked about the Dynabar and I talked about commands. There are some commands, I'll just point this out from the get-go. There's some commands where you get inside of it and there's this paradigm where you open a command, it expects you to select something and then hit a next button, which we will talk about as we go through a workflow here. And then once you hit that next button, it will let you use the rest of the Dynabar. So I just point that out from the beginning that sometimes it goes into these different modes where you select the command, you have to select something else in order to prompt it to do the next thing. So that is part of the interface that I point out ahead of time just to let people know how it works. Now there are little, there are other little 
quirks to the interface and how it works, but I'll point those out along the way. So now that we cover the interface, let's talk about creating our first part, just making a new part. So the reason why I phrase it that way is you can start from a blank screen like this and you can, when you go to file new, you can start with an empty model space or you can start with a basic shape. So some people are going to be creating designs from a blank screen or from a prismatic base model. So that's why we have this in here that way. So when you open up your first model, what I want you to do here is I'm going to record what to do in this little tutorial, and then you can pause the video and practice these steps yourself. This first section is just intended to get you comfortable with the haptic device itself. You're not going to create anything groundbreaking here. You're basically going to start with a basic shape and use the haptic with a few tools in order to orient yourself with the haptic device. And you will see quickly, you will, you'll see why I'm telling you to do this because the haptic is very foreign to a lot of people. Just having a fully 3D, a full 3D mouse in front of you on the table and getting used to orienting it to the model in space and touching and just getting used to it and actually feeling like you have control over the haptic is paramount and going through this exercise will help you do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a cube. So you're going to click on start with shape, click cube, and you'll see that we can actually define the, the dimensions of the cube itself. 100 by 100 by 100 millimeters and you'll notice this is what I mean when I go all the way back to the beginning of this tutorial that I we design in units to scale physical parts with this software it's not 100 of whatever this is 100 millimeters everything is going to be scaled because our goal with freeform is to actually make these so the size actually matters. I am starting with the general size of what I want this cube to be, right? Now, you'll see that it says 100 millimeters. Below that, you have this clay coarseness. And it says edge sharpness, rough shape. What's going on here? We use clay to talk about the voxel object. So... Freeform is primarily a voxel modeler, right? Volumetric pixels, right? Um, and the volumetric pixels is essentially a stack of cubes. It's cubes that are such a fine resolution, those stack of cubes represent a 3D model in space in X, Y, and Z, right? And the clay, we call voxels clay in the software. That's a substitute name just because it acts a lot like clay when you're sculpting it. And that's the goal of the software is to appeal to designers and people to design stuff with a sculpting type interface, right? Now the rough shape, these are actually presets. So if I say rough shape, that's two millimeters, refined shape, one millimeter, add detail, half a millimeter. And this is all based off of the perspective the potential dimensions of this. So those change based on the size and of the object. So if I had this was like a thousand millimeters, then your clay coarseness at rough fine, and those are, they're different, right? And then of course, at the very bottom, you have custom. So you can type in whatever voxel dimension you want to use. So real quick, I'm gonna hit okay. And I created mine at half a millimeter. And we will talk about how to rotate this in a second. But real quick, I wanted to talk a little bit more about voxels and show you visually a slide from my PowerPoint just to make sure everyone understands what those are. So here's a slide of different kinds of 3D models that exist inside of software.
right? Now, the one that we're dealing with with freeform, this is the primary modeling type of freeform is voxels. And that little icon shows exactly what we're talking about. They're little uh, pixels that are in 3D. But when you raise this resolution to a certain level, you have this fine grain of sand voxels that represent this 3D shape. Many people in the 3D scanning world are used to dealing with polygons or point clouds. I say these are relatives of each other because if you take just the vertices of a polygon, you have a point cloud, right? And then polygon mesh is adding another layer of intelligence by connecting the points together into a surface that has edges like you see here. So this is a polygon object. Look, at it's a representation of a 3D model just like this. But instead of being volumetric cubes, this one actually is a surface mesh. So it's actually hollow. It's not volumetric like this one. And this is a zoomed in piece of a polygon just to show you what it, this looks like if you zoomed all the way in. Another type is subdivisional modeling. A lot of animators use this soft, uh, this type of model. It's In a way, it's kind of like uh, having a polygon arc uh, armature around the outside of a CAD model. Um, but And we'll get into the CAD model here in a second. Sub-Ds are used in animation. I point them out because Freeform works in all four of these categories. Um, and while we're not going to cover Sub-Ds today, I just point out that they do exist and they're great for organic modeling as well. And then on the right hand side, this is the most popular version of uh, modeling that exists today. CAD packages like SolidWorks, Inventor, AutoCAD, they all work with these non-uniform rational B-splines, NURB surfaces. Um, and what they do is they try to make a very simple, intuitive interface for creating manufacturable parts. CAD is very powerful, and cars are designed in CAD, cell phones are designed in CAD, everything's designed in CAD, right? Where they're really good as these very complicated assemblies and all that. But where they struggle is the more organic the shape, the more difficult it is to re to design inside of CAD. So Freeform, its primary method is to complement CAD by adding this Freeform type of interface to design in 3D alongside of CAD and work in conjunction with it. So lots of people in the manufacturing world will have CAD as their main platform and Freeform is this other software that helps design the shapes. I know that's a very vague explanation, but this just shows you that these are the four types of models that Freeform works in, although its primary modeling type is voxels. So I just wanted to point that out. Now, just to elaborate on what people do with Freeform and the different types of models, I figured I would jump over to this slide really quick. These are areas that we're in, you know, product design and manufacturing very complicated shapes. And these are some uh, customers that use our stuff. So Ma most people know that Mattel uses our software to design many, 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 many different types of toys. Um, the medical world uses Freeform to work directly off of scans, whether they're CT scans or 3D scans of people's anatomy, and you can design directly off of it. You can create molds of organic shapes like different types of products like this is a cake mold type scenario. And then th these are some medical examples from the dental world or the prosthetics and facial reconstruction. And then we even have customers like this right here. Razor companies use our freeform uh, software to design these highly organic shapes and then they use uh, freeform to then convert them over to CAD shapes and manufacturer these highly organic shapes, and it helps them just develop them. So again, this goes back to how Freeform actually works. We talked about voxels. We're, we're about to create a voxel part in here. I just point that 
this freeform is this hybrid model that works in all of these areas. And it's utilizing these, even, sometimes even behind the scenes. So if I do something on a on a voxel mesh, sometimes it's actually using a NURB surface behind the scenes to do something. Sometimes it's using a polygon mesh to do something behind the scenes. But I just wanted to point that out, that as we create our first model, that we are creating a voxel, a volumetric pixel part. Now, in order to rotate this with your haptic, so you're going to be in this view right here when you create it, you pick up your haptic device, and if you have the touch X, you only have one button. So in order to rotate it, you have to click the G, H, and J keys. The G is the free rotate, zoom, pan, everything all in one tool. You'll see what I mean when you press it. You move your haptic around, and then you can let go of the G key, move the haptic again, and rotate. So you can use that as a way to work your way around the shape of an object by letting go of the button and picking it up and letting it go. Now the H is zoom and pan only. This is very useful with sketching. You want to zoom in and zoom out without breaking your view of the part. And then the J is actually rotate in one direction 90 degrees and you'll feel it has a haptic snap if you rotate far enough. Up, down, left, right, it will rotate ha with a haptic snap. So if I go to the, just the front view and I hit J, it will rotate 90 degrees. If I let go, rotate 90 degrees. Now you can hit H and kind of zoom out a little bit and then do the same thing. So you're getting used to how to use this. You can also use the arrow keys, which rotate in 15 degree increments. So I'll just go back to the home view and rotate this way, that way, right? And then I'll actually just orient to like some sort of almost isometric view and then use my arrow keys. You can see it better as it's rotating, but it's ro rotating according to my camera view. So you can rotate around the object. Now, by default, you'll notice where, so we're rotating around H key, J rotate. You get to a pleasant view of the part. You have your haptic. And by default, it's in this carve with ball tool. Um, you'll notice it's really small in this instance. If I want to change the size down here, the tool size command, you can adjust that. You can hit type in 10 and it changes the size. Or on your keyboard, you know where your backspace key is? To the left of that, you have a plus and a minus key. If you hit plus and minus, it will allow you to change the size up and down. So now that you have you know, the right size tool, if you press the primary button on the haptic and just press into the part, you'll see that you can sculpt. And then you can hit undo, command Z. And we have undo, redo under the edit. You'll see command Z, command Y. Those follow the industry standards of undo. So you can use the G key and then let go. And if you want to, you can actually create the dice. And you can say, hey, I want to push in and create a die by making two on that side, coming around and put one on this side. If you want to get all fancy, you can actually figure out where they actually go. We're not going to do that here. So I don't know where they actually, because there's a pattern to where they, so you see how you're creating three, four, and what this does is, this is intended as an exercise just to get you familiar with the haptic itself and to practice putting the haptic where you intend to place it and just use the haptic for a second and get used to it because it is very foreign at the beginning. 
Now, if anything happens with your haptic, like it's off screen or whatever, if you have the touch, put it back in the inkwell, it'll reset zero. If, if it's not centered on screen here, you can move it to the top left, bottom right, top right, bottom left, pull it straight out, push it underneath of the underneath of the base, and then you're back to back to normal where you're kind of zeroed out the physical haptic envelope of the device to the screen. Occasionally it could get off like that. So that's how you can kind of reset it is with the regular touch, you put it in the inkwell with the touch X, you exercise it and it actually becomes kind of intuitive after a while to be able to just move the haptic around in order to adjust it. So you see here, you just kind of, and you'll notice how hard it is. You're like, oh, I started in the wrong place. So I can actually hit undo. And nobody's striving for perfection here. We're not trying to make this perfect die, dice here. Die or dice. You're just trying to understand how the software works and create a die. Now, if I wanted to model a perfect die, I would actually just use CAD, right? I wouldn't do it in Freeform. What Freeform is good at, you can design a die very specifically and very accurate in, in here. But the reason why most people want to use this, because maybe they're creating a die that looks like it's been used for many, many years or it was handmade or something, right? So that's what Freeform is designed to do. Like that's why so many product design companies they want to create this object and make it look real, like somebody made it by hand out of wood or ivory or whatever, bones or whatever, um, and make that. So you see that we use this sphere to carve this die. Now, if I want to add some more detail to it to make it look more realistic, what I can do is come over to the hot wax tool which is over here, it's that orange ball. And again, you can click Alt and drag it over to your favorites. Now what this does is it has, it's, it's a smoothing tool. And like most of the software you'll notice is they use the language of sculpture and art, whether it's clay and hot wax. Hot wax is uh, a term that's a lot of sculptors design things in wax because it can hold detail and you can use these wax sculptures to make figurines and all kinds of different artistic pieces and then create molds off of them and then produce these. So with the hot wax, what you're doing is sometimes when you sculpt with a hot wax, with wax, you use a torch to sometimes melt away or use hot tools to melt it, to smooth it out after you've scraped the surface with something, then you would come back and melt it away. So you can see here with the hot wax, I have it cranked up pretty high, the level. And you'll see here, and look at how as I touch it and use the button, it's melting away. It's kind of melting and smoothing. This tool is really powerful to make things look very natural, right? So I can come around and just melt things with the hot wax tool. Now the hot wax tool has some different options. That's just the regular melt. There's another smooth melt that's a slightly different algorithm. That's essentially, we've discovered some different algorithms that work differently over the years and it's very similar to the original melt. And the help describes a lot of these differences. And again, in this instance, if you're sculpting this in freeform, a lot of what you're trying to do is make it look realistic. You know, make it look like it's something that's handmade. Um, so you can see here, I can melt those edges and just create that shape. Now, it also has melt add and melt remove. So if I hit this and hit melt add, it's just going to like add material to it. Or you could have used add melt remove to make these same holes. So if I just push in, I could use that to make it. So I can even use that to add a little more depth to these. It's going to smooth and push in at the same time, right? And honestly, the name of the game with Freeform in this instance is, is trying to 
sculpt something that looks really neat, like very artistic shape. So you can see how I'm going around and creating this die. Just adding, adding deviation and adding, making it not perfect, right? That's what freeform and having the haptic is. You're adding that hand touch into it that makes it look so realistic. So again, going around. Now, one other thing I'll point out that's not useful for this for this uh, specific tutorial of making a die is you can come back over to the carve with ball and you notice that like again I we've been carving from the outside and you see here this is how like I could always make it look like it's been you know sculpt from the outside like it's been hitting the concrete for years and years or whatever I can sculpt from the outside now if I just take the haptic and put it on the surface and push hard to the inside. Sometimes this happens on accident for people. That now the haptic is actually inside of the body. This isn't, this is a feature, not a, an error, right? Like you can actually come inside and sculpt from the inside out. I'm pressing the button and I'm sculpting from the inside out, right? So this is really neat too. Like again, you can come in here and you can just add, and then if I'm done, I'll just pull out. And again, you'll see uh, throughout the, you know, if I, need, if I want to add scratches and dings and things like that to the surface, I can come in here. A lot of times you'll start with kind of sculpting the shape and roughing it in and then come back and add smoothing to it later. It all depends on what you're trying to, to accomplish, what kind of look you're trying to get. And then you can come back over to the hot wax tool, smooth this out. See how you can create a, a giant mess really fast in here. If you, if you're just messing around, you can, you can <laughs> create modern art real quick here. So this is the tutorial on how to create a die. Now, as you've been doing this, you may feel really, as you grab the haptic and you're doing this, you may feel really weird. I know that when I grabbed the haptic and was using it at the beginning, when you first grab it, it just feels foreign because you're trying to control this thing in 3D and it feels like it's out of control, like you don't know what to expect, like how it works and what it's doing. And it's just very difficult to get used to at the beginning. It can be. Some people just take to it right away and they love it and they're just off and running and they're sculpting things. And then other people, sometimes it does take a minute to get used to it. Now, what I find is the people that it takes a minute to get used to are trying to figure out a proper posture, right? So the way I set up my haptic is I like to push it back on the table and anchor my elbow or forearm on the edge of the table or on the table itself. There's different, there's different postures that tend to work. Um, and what I discovered is there are people that if they don't, if they're struggling to get a good feel for the haptic and make it do exactly what they're trying to do on screen and it's str it's a struggle it's that they haven't found the proper posture yet so move the haptic around on the table push it back and forth towards on the side of the monitor anchor your arm on the either the edge of the table or on the table itself and then we even have some customers that purchase like different types of computer armrests that work really well for them too where they have this armrest and they put their arm in that and then that helps them anchor their arm on the table um, so this is like my little tutorial on how to sculpt with a couple tools in here you can you can use the hot wax the sculpt with uh carve with ball 
And then the last one that I'll point out here on the same in the same palette. Actually, it's not in the same palette. It's, it's uh, where did it go? Ah, uh, yes, under deform clay. So under deform clay, the first one right here is the tug tool. With the tug tool, again, you can change the size. And the way this tool works is you can click and just pull on the surface of the clay. You just pull it out. And if I let go, you can see how I can just create all kinds of craziness. And this is why we say check out how it can act a lot like clay, right? So I'm going to undo. For this type of, for this type of uh, model, the tug tool can actually be used to add some deviation to it on a larger scale here. So if I just grab this and I just pull a little bit and just manipulate the shape so it's no longer a perfect cube anymore, right? And I can push in and out and manipulate the surface. See how it's like convex now? I can, I can actually pull out a little. Just add more deviation more handcrafted aspect to it using the another thing you can do with this is uh, modify these holes with it too so if i shrink this down there's just so many ways of using these tools so i could pull deeper make it more shallow right like that i could skew it if i look at it from a different angle here See how I can just skew it this way or that way using that and just distort. That actually looks a lot like a die, right? Where it, So it's not a perfectly round and it's not a perfectly spherical depth. It's more of like a, a shallow. See that? So you can use the tug tool. The tug tool takes a lot of getting used to in order to make it do exactly what you want. And again, you can combine this with another tool like the hot wax tool and you can come back and smooth that out, whatever you've done, whatever mess you've made. And a lot of times people have to kind of repeat this, repeat this tutorial over and over again just to get a feel for how to model with the haptic. This exercise isn't about creating a beautiful model. A lot of times it looks like garbage when you get done your first project here, but it's just to get you the feel of the haptic and how to use some of these basic tools. So now that we've completed this exercise, now we're dangerous. Now we can start to do a project. Um, by making a brace. So the tutorial that I like to start people with is just creating a basic brace. It's just taking a few more tools and building on top of what we know right now to create a brace using a 3D scan. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and open up. I have a file called arm best start that will be linked to this video. So if you can click and drag and say, I don't want to save what's in there, and then boom, you have this file, arm best start. Or you can just go to file open and open it up and locate it wherever it is on the drive. Now, by default, you'll see that I have a clay object in here. And then I also have over here a polygon. And you can see here I can activate the polygon. So polygon objects are this purple color and the voxel objects are the flesh tone color, right? So you'll notice what already happened before you started. And then you see, I also have the empty piece like we talked about. So if I want to hide everything, it will automatically activate the empty piece. And then I can turn this on and I can activate it. Um, so we'll be doing some activation during this tutorial. Now, when you open a part, um, if you start from a blank screen and you say, I want to import a mesh file, when you import the mesh file, 
it's going to ask you to like convert it. It's going to assume you want to convert that straight away into a, a voxel object. Now, what I prefer to do is instead of converting it on import, I just change the setting to bring it in as a mesh. So real quick, I'll just show you what that looks like because that already happened before I brought this in. Um, I use this as a demo file for a lot of different things, and I think that it's, you know, you don't need to talk about this for a customer. If you're showing this to somebody else, you don't need to talk about this process, but for training purposes is what I'm doing here. This is uh, helpful to know. So if you come over to File, Opening opens the clay files, the .cly files that the software works with. Those .cly files can be a container that holds meshes, that holds voxel objects, that holds cat objects, right? All these different things that open sub D uh, objects. That container holds those. Now, if you want to import something like a mesh into a clay file, then you come over to import. Now, if you come over to import and I come over to arm best start PLY and I hit import, this is what the interface looks like. It's saying, okay, I want to take this mesh and create it as a clay. If it has any holes, because mesh files can have lots of holes and voids and things. Um, what resolution do you want the clay file to be? Like you can say, I want this to be, you can even customize and say, I want it to be one millimeter voxels and convert it and then what type of hole filling to do and then hit apply. And what it'll do is upon import, it will convert it over to a voxel object. The reason why I don't like this is I'm converting it to a voxel object upon import. What if I select the wrong edge sharpness? What if I want to, I should have done 0.5 instead. So what I do is I toggle over to import it as a mesh, hit OK. Now I have two mesh files in here. So I'm just going to delete this one. I don't need it anymore. And now I have this mesh file. So I just brought it in. Don't do anything to it. Now, if I want to convert this to a voxel object, I can come over to Mesh Utilities under the right-click menu, Copy to Clay. It takes me into that same spot. And the thing that's nice is it keeps what I have. So if I say I want this to be a 0.5 voxel resolution, fill all holes, tangent zero, hit apply, you'll see now that it creates another 0.5 millimeter resolution clay piece, which I also don't need. Um, but I just talk about that. That's an interesting process. It's something that exists within the software that most people may not understand how to import them in and just bring it in. My best practice is bring it in. That way I always have the backup there. The other thing that you can do is we'll do this, we'll delete this real quick, is before you start work on any of the arm, right now it's already kind of aligned. So when you bring in a scan, most of the time it's going to come in like this. Right? Now I'll get out of that command, and you're like, oh, I imported the scan. It's floating off in Never Never Land. So what I like to use is F2 is my home view, right? Where X, Y, and Z is at me. I like to bring stuff into that coordinate system, even if it's just moving it manually. I at least like to put it into this coordinate system before I start working with it. You don't have to, but it can create lots of problems down the road and lots of extra work for no reason. So what you can do is come over to reposition piece. And when you reposition piece, you have down here in the dialog, by default, I believe it's in move only. So I can just grab the piece and move it only. So I just moved it over the coordinate system. But if I use my arrow keys to rotate, you see, and go to the X, you see that it's off in a couple different axes, right? So you'll have to come in, and then I can go back to F2. So now I need to start adjusting the rotation. I can toggle over to ro rotate only as well. Or I could turn all of those off and I could do rotate and translate 
So if I just, these are toggles where you turn them on and off where it says move only, rotate only, right? In this instance, and then I could say, you know, move it to zero for me. And then I could just pick it up and rotate it. What happens a lot of times is when you're rotating it, you, you kind of square it up to the world and then toggle over to move only and then manipulate it that way. And you see front to back, I need to rotate it maybe. Maybe I need to do this and then go back to move only. Another thing that we need to introduce as a tool is this axis snap, which is really helpful. Axis snap will allow me to move the piece and, and it has a haptic guide to it. So if I go just up a little bit and just down, you'll see that it will help guide my haptic to only move in one direction, right? So that axis guide is really powerful. Another really powerful tool is this inchworm for pr precise movement. What that does is as I move it, it, as I move the haptic, it does a two to one-ish. I'm not sure, uh, we'd have to check with the product management the exact ratio there, but it's like a two to one movement ratio where I'm moving the haptic twice as far as the model actually moves in the software. And what this helps you do is have very precise movement. Because sometimes you had a little bit too much coffee, right? And you're trying to figure, and it even works in rotating as well. So if I want to rotate about that axis, rotate about that axis, it's a two to one. And then I'll just jump back over to move only. Move only. And again, you can go you can go to town with this and you, you can keep going. Depends on how OCD you are. But what happens is is I will I just get it in a known location, which this is going to be my starting point. This is where I'm just going to once I drop it in this location and if that's where I want it to be, this is where I, I'm just gonna start and then not move it from there, and then everything will be based on this home position. Now, one thing about the inchworm that I have to remind everyone is it's a global toggle that stays on. So if I turn on inchworm here, and then I use another tool that has inchworm as an option, it will be on in that tool, and it'll always be on. And what happens is people forget it's on, and they can't figure out why the software is not behaving appropriately. So I like to make sure I to tell everyone, toggle that on and off real fast and don't forget about it, right? Because that's helpful. You can also use, as you're moving, you can hold shift. You can hold shift as a shortcut to go into Inchworm as well, which is really helpful. You can see that by row, row, uh, rolling your mouse over top of it and you'll see down at the bottom it tells you like that you can use that shortcut. So now that I've moved this part back into the location that I want, we can go ahead and start our workflow. So we went ahead and reposition piece um, and if you want to you can hold alt and drag reposition piece over into your favorites palette and then keep moving from there. You can use those arrows. One final thing about this is if I really wanted to be very precise about my movement of this arm, this little arrow right here, this little thing people overlook, but it's a super powerful tool. If I click that, it opens this palette that allows me to manually move this using translation values, right? So I can say my translation step and my rotation step so my translation step is one millimeter right now. So if I say translate in the Y axis, and I just click up, I'm moving it up by one millimeter, down by one millimeter. So I can actually come in, and if I was extremely OCD, and I can use the arrow keys and go to the side, if I want to rotate it about X, 15 degrees, right? I can do that. Or if I want to adjust, adjust this down to one degree, let's type in one. 
about X, move the part. And so this isn't just for this command. Whenever you see this arrow, you will have a dialog box because you need to be able to move things throughout the software. And I'll point that out if, if we see it in another spot later. But this little arrow dialog box, whenever you see that, it means that you have values that you can adjust. All right, so that is the introduction of moving the part, getting it imported, um, and getting it over into position. Now we come back over and say mesh utilities, copy to clay. And we already talked about this clay, half a millimeter. Let's go ahead and keep it that. You could do tangent geo, apply. So now it's going to convert that over into a clay piece. And we are ready to start creating our brace. Now, before we do, I want to introduce some content some concepts here in order to design the brace the way i want to do it today i need to show you how to use planes inside of freeform so if i come over here and i maximize this you can create planes move planes copy the profiles um, hide and show all planes um, so the this is your planes dialog now if i click on create plane Freeform is not like CAD in this sense. That it it likes to just create planes with a variety of different construction methods. And it just goes ahead and creates it, and then you can manipulate it. Where in CAD, lots of times you have to select the proper geometry and a certain kind of construction method to create a plane, right? The way this works is I tend to do it this way. I go to my front view. And I'll just hit undo real quick. I'll go to my front view if that's where I want the plane normal direction to be. And then I'll hit create plane. And then by default, I can say create it normal to that view. You know, or if I wanted a plane in this direction, I'll just orient my view towards it and then hit create plane. And then you have this option to say orient flat to view. And you'll see that it created a plane flat to that viewpoint. And then I can hit F2. And actually, I can actually just rebuild that plane by saying, now orient it flat to this view. There's lots of different options in here. So if I go orient flat to this view, touching clay. So this option is touching the clay. So it's going to just take the highest point from that direction and then bump it up against the clay to create a plane. Uh, if I go F2, I could say through origin. I could say through origin, touching clay, normal to. So it's doing it. <laughs> um, I could also say through the part. Actually, this one is through origin. This one is through the parts origin. So this one is through origin of the workspace. This one's through a parts origin. And then you could say through halfway through the part there. And then actually this is another instance where you can say, remember the little arrow key, the little arrow button? If I maximize that, I can type in the absolutes. I could say, I want this to be at zero, zero zero and create that plane through zero 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 and then i can manually key in okay rotate it 90 degrees um rotate it this direction 90 degrees and you'll see that i can just key in where i wanted it instead of just creating it in free floating space right so that's some of the basics and now i can also use the haptic so if I come in and zoom in, now planes can be a little bit weird at first. I have to find, like my haptic is going to touch the plane, and I have, to, I have to look at the plane and then use the haptic and drive in towards the base of the haptic until I touch the plane. Now I can actually drag the plane and move it, right? So I can, and I depending on where I touch the plane, 
I can do lots of different things. So I can drag it this direction and use that axis snap and you see that it only moves in that Z direction. And then you'll notice what keeps happening there is I can touch an axis and I'm gonna go ahead and drag this plane to make it wider. So I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna to touch the plane and I'm gonna come up to the corner. I'm gonna drag the corner, come up to the corner there and make it bigger right now it makes it easier to see what i'm talking about so if i come in and touch the plane i can feel it and as i move towards the middle of the plane i have the ability to rotate it with haptics in that direction if i come over to the edge of the plane i can actually rotate it and it has haptic snaps as well so you see here i can resize the plane i can drag the edge of the plane and I can even come into these different axes here and rotate it that way. Complete control over the plane. Now, for example, if I move this way off in here, and I let's say that this is fine for me, what I'm going to do. If I just really wanted it to be in a certain location, I can move it close. And then I can come over and say, okay, for X, Y, I'm going to say my X, Y, I want to be zeros. And then my depth, I'm going to say it needs to be like 80 millimeters and put it in an exact location. So see how you can do that. So now I created my half, uh, my, and I can even control the, the height and width. If I want it to be like 500 by 500, like you can see how you, I did it by 50 on accident there. So there we created a plane. None of this is pertinent to this, but I, I, planes are very important to know how to create them. And it's helpful to come through all of these. Once you understand the general idea of what I'm talking about here, it's easy to come in and play with each setting and kind of get a grasp and understanding of what's going on as you work with the software. So now that I created that plane, we can go ahead and get out of that by coming over to the select or pressing the S key. So now I have a plane and you'll see it's the plane is on that arm that we developed. Now, what we're going to do now is jump over into a sketching tutorial. So we created the plane. Now I need to be able to sketch on it. And the way we're going to design this brace will make sense once I show you the next tool after we sketch. So just trust me as we sketch this out, draw a similar sketch that I'm going to do. And then you'll see how this all comes together because the tool that we're going to use is called Shellcut Clay. And I've never seen a tool in any other software work this way. So you'll see how it all comes together after we create this sketch. But in order to sketch on this plane, there's a, a variety of ways you can do that. You can click on the plane and hit sketch over here. Or I actually prefer to click on the icon over here and hit sketch on. Now by default, it takes you normal to the plane and puts you in a sketch mode. If you're in the sketch mode, make sure to use the H key to zoom and pan. Don't use the G key because if you use the G key, all of a sudden you move the, you break the normal to of the plane, the orientation. But if you need to get back to that, you can click on the icon and come down to look at and it will take you directly back there again. So you can then come back and zoom in. Now you can use the sketch tools. Today we're just going to introduce three different sketch tools. The freehand curve, the line, and the trim. Um, so the, these sketching tools are a little bit primitive. They're a little old school, but all the stuff you really need to be able to do is possible in here. You just have to get a little bit creative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a curve across this top here, like so. Like that and then when I'm done and I want to close the curve two ways to do it I can hit the stop sign down here at the bottom or I can hit the E key on the keyboard and it will close that now I can come over here and if I want my a curve to go across the thumb I hit the E key just like that now I can toggle over to the line tool and I can draw a line between those two if I want to. And then I can use the H key to zoom out 
maybe draw a straight line across down here and I can draw a straight line and instead of instead of drawing it to the end point I'm just going to crisscross them there and then in this one I'm going to snap it the reason why I did that is it's a red sketch right now so that means this is still an open profile but if I come over to trim this does a trim closest so if I click on the piece that I want to chop off and trim to the other one now you'll see that I've trimmed this. This is a closed profile. And I need a tr closed profile for this specific workflow. So I'm going to come in now. And I'm just going to zoom in and tweak this a little bit. I want to make sure in this instance, this I didn't draw that exactly the way I wanted to. So what I'm going to do is just come in and draw maybe from here to there and then come over and trim those so trim trim you see it just trim it just does a trim closest and the reason why i did that is i want to stay away from the anatomy where i make that jog over and then use the h key to zoom out so i have this blue cr closed profile now if i want to get out of the sketch mode two different ways i can hit exit sketch mode in the sketch palette or I can just hit the S key or click over to the select icon over in my palette right so in there now I drew a 2d sketch on that surface now doesn't really come into play for this uh, part but if you had a 2d sketch that was already drawn in another software like a DXF or something you can come over to file import to plane and you can import parts. You can click on the plane and you can import supported files in here. Uh, JPEGs, uh, Adobe Illustrator, DXFs. So if I wanted to import a profile to a plane or an image and put it on a plane, I can do that. Just a little side tip there. So now we're going to go ahead and create our plane our not our plane but our brace by using this tool called shell cut clay shell cut clay is in the construct clay palette right here and it is that circle with a gray side to it if i click on it this is one of the tools that i was talking about that has a slightly different paradigm when you come in it doesn't let you do everything everything's grayed out before you can do anything in this tool, it expects that you have to have, it says at the bottom there, at the very bottom of the uh, dialog, select a closed profile on a sketch plane. So I have to come over with the haptic and I click on the closed profile, and then you have to hit the next button. Once you hit the next button, it's gonna show you a from and to plane. Now, you use the haptics you can actually click i can come around this plane and touch this plane and once i feel it i can click and drag and i can come around this plane click and drag the from and to planes i can adjust those on screen like that and then manipulate all i want to do is make sure that it goes completely through the part I just don't want this to happen where the from and to plane, one of them is like intersecting the model. I just need to make sure it goes past. Um, so you can adjust those. Now with the thickness, we're going to make a four millimeter thick brace. So we're going to say to create the brace at four millimeters. Now, the reason why we have this dialogue set up the way it is, is sometimes the you may want to offset a brace that has a, the, a void between the anatomy and the brace itself. So for example, if I wanted a two millimeter thick brace and I wanted two millimeters between my hand and the brace itself, but then I wanted the brace itself to be two millimeters thick, I could come in and type in two millimeter thick brace four millimeter offset so it's going to offset it four millimeters the original model and then thicken it 
two millimeters. So it's a really weird way to think about it, but it gives you a lot of flexibility. In this instance, we are going to keep it simple. We're going to offset the brace four millimeters and offset it, and its thickness is going to be four millimeters. The other thing is make sure to switch it over to volumetric shelling. I find that it works better with this type of workflow. Turn off front only. Make sure voxel grid is turned on. And then the last thing is this icon over here, which is a new interface thing that we're introducing. This says that the part we create, the geometry we create from this tool, make it as a new piece, right? So this is create as new. Now, because these are voxel objects, it's saying, okay, I'm gonna make a new piece, but what resolution should I make it? Now, you recognize that I made the original arm half a millimeter voxel resolution. Half a millimeter doesn't do a, a good job at representing a four millimeter thick, right? So it'd be only eight voxels thick, right? So I, it's not a good practice to make very large voxels for a thin piece like we're gonna, about to do. So in this instance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say create this uh, brace. Let's start out at 0.2 voxel resolution, edge sharpness. So now when I hit apply, I'm going to go ahead and hit apply because it actually takes a second for this to run. It will create the shape as a 0.2 voxel resolution. Now, I didn't explain what this tool actually is doing. Shellcut Clay is actually almost like a macro of, of like three or four different operations. What it's going to do is take the, the profile that I drew, it's going to extrude it. It's going to offset the entire hand, the, the four millimeter right? It's then going to intersect the extrusion with the offset, intersect them wherever they overlap, keep that geometry and delete everything else. Then it's going to subtract the original anatomy away from the piece. So all of that is going to result in taking this profile and making a brace. You'll see exactly what I mean once it finishes. So this process, this tool takes a long time, I will say. And depending on your graphics card and your machine speed, it'll take a second for it to run. And it's because it is doing so many things all at once, it'll take a second. I just tell you that right from the get go. If it's taking too long, you could always escape out of it and do it as a 0.3 resolution if your machine is underpowered. So I'll just point that out. I'm doing this at a 0.2. It shouldn't take too long to run. So what are we going to do now is turn off the plane. I don't need that anymore. I can hit the S key to get out of the that command and look at what we did. This is exactly what I was talking about. I'm going to hide the arm and see how it created this four millimeter brace. So again, it took that extrusion, extruded it, offset this, intersected them together, uh, did a Boolean intersect, and then subtracted the anatomy. That's a good simple way of describing exactly what it did. Um, and then again, we talked about just housekeeping. You can then say, rename this brace, right? And then you can just rename this arm. So this is active now. Now, if I hide the arm and, and just kind of rotate the piece around, you'll see that how would anybody get their arm inside of this thing? Right? There's not really a good way to get it in there. You would have to, if this is a nice flexible material, one way to do it is to cut a seam down the side, which we can talk about here in a second. And then the other thing is, what if you need some areas of relief? Like if you needed an area of relief on the back, like a hole. So we're gonna do a couple of those things here. We'll go ahead and cut a hole in there and then uh, cut the piece so then you can actually put it on. 
So the first thing, we'll go ahead and cut the hole in the back because I think this introduces um, some tools that are necessary first, and then we'll work off of uh, work off of the uh, what we build on this to then apply to cutting the side. Um, so the way I like to cut the holes through venting holes and things like that is I will use the original arm object, this guy right here. You can duplicate it. You don't have to. It all just depends on... I'll just call it arm cut. And what we will do is we can actually make the brace transparent. So if I activate it and hit the D key, depending on your software, your your machine, if your machine isn't that powerful with a good graphics card, this tool may not work that well, the transparency. And then I can come over and activate the main piece. Now we're going to introduce 3D curves. So we talked about 2D sketching on planes. Now we can come over to the curves palette and go to draw a curve and introduce these. So if I go to draw a curve, the first thing to understand is snapping the fitting tool right here. Fitting will say, I'm going to draw on the clay. If I have that turned off, it means I can just draw wherever I want to in 3D. Look at this. I'm just drawing in 3D space. It's not snapped to anything, right? Now, if I turn on fitting, I, I toggle that on. As I click, it actually snaps to the surface. Now, you don't want to draw that way. What you want to do is put your, put your stylus all the way down on the surface and trace it, right? And then rotate it around. So you see, I just drew that curve on the brace on accident. So here's a problem that you can do. On accident, I drew that on the brace because I accidentally had the brace activated. So what I can do is I can hit undo, and I undid too far, so I'm going to hit redo. And redo one more time to where I duplicated it. There we go. So now I'm going to actually draw on the arm itself. So you, that is a, a common mistake, right? I drew on the brace instead of the arm that I want to use for cutting. And again, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. I'm going to come over and I have fitting on. There's a few different ways you can draw. You could draw it all as one shape or draw and trim it like we did before. So like I can draw this shape here. And if I want to end a curve, you can hit the stop sign just like we did before or hit the E key like we did before. And with these curves, I tend to not overdraw them. I tend to draw them and use the nodes, but you can trim curves together if you need to. It's just extra steps if you want to trim stuff. And then I'm just drawing on the surface of the part. And the reason why I have the brace there is I want to make sure that I'm drawing in an area that does intersect the brace. So I could draw it as a square. I could just draw a circle vent if I want to. Um, and then if I want to edit these curves after, so let's say I created them, but I'm not really happy with them. Um, just to save on processing speed, I can come over here to activate the brace, hit the D key, and then hide that. That way, because I don't need it. I kind of rough this in. So now I can come back and click on the curves, and you'll see it tells me this curve is four edit points, and it's fit to the surface right now. I can move these curves around if I want to on the surface. I can move the tangency around. I could always snap it, the tangency. I could click down here on this curve and I could snap the tangency with the other curve if I needed to. Let's go ahead and do that because since I went ahead and did it. 
And then I can click on these curves and move them around and make whatever kind of design I'm thinking of. Now you notice I only have the four cur uh, nodes that I dr originally drew, but I can, I can add them. So if I click on it, I can hit this plus minus curve here and I can add, as I click, it'll add nodes. Now if I want to remove nodes, I can just roll over whatever that I have created. And then this is a toggle tool, so you have to turn it back off when you're done. So if for some reason I wanted to create this weird shape. And then I can re-establish the tangency over here with the curves. So again, you can kind of go around to each curve and rebuild it. One other thing that I will point out is um, if I click on this curve, let's say I want to retopologize that curve with having more nodes. I could just say, oh, make eight points equally spaced on there. So you can you can just select the curve and say, make 10 nodes on it, you know, and you can re reduce, you can go the other direction too. Make only five, take it back down to five again. And play around with the shape. So there is my curve shape that I created on the surface. And then now what I'm going to do is come over to Detail Clay right here, Emboss with Curve. And if, just like we talked about before, holding Alt, drag it up, I have Emboss with Curve up here. Now, Emboss with Curve, when you go inside of it, it's just like some of the other tools. It's expecting you to select a curve in order to do anything. So you really can't do anything until I click on the curve. Now, this is one of those times where it's actually expecting more than one thing. It wants to know like what curve to use and what side of the curve are we gonna emboss. So I have to touch the clay with the haptic here and place this little green ball telling it, okay, I want you to offset anything inside of this boundary. I'm gonna say five millimeters and then hit offset raise or lower. In this instance, I want to raise it. So you see, I'm going to raise that up. Now, if I turn the brace on, you'll see that I raise that surface of the arm higher than the surface of the brace. That way, I can use that arm cut. I can click on the, the uh, object itself, come over to Boolean, say remove from, and in order to run that, I have to get out of this command. I have to come over to the select tool, come back over here, Boolean, remove from. And I want to remove it from the brace object. So I say remove from brace, hit OK. Now, it takes it a second to calculate, and then you don't really notice much happen on screen, but I have to hide the arm. And now you'll see that it actually cut that away. I can turn these curves off too if I'm done with them. Now, sometimes when you're cutting things, you'll see a little bit of the, the chatter of voxels on the edge, a little bit of a ragged edge, almost like you cut it with a jigsaw or something. The way we deal with those ragged edges is I sometimes will leave them till I'm done and I'm ready to to uh, to work with them at the end. But the way you can do that is you can change the clay coarseness by clicking on the object. And then I also set clay coarseness to my favorites menu. So when I hit this, I say clay coarseness. Now, what you can do, the trick is to just change the clay coarseness by just a fraction. So one, nine, 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 right? And if you change the clay coarseness just barely, it kind of retopologizes the whole shape. And it just has this natural, pleasant smoothing to the edges that happens. So that's just a rule of thumb, something that helps.
So we went ahead and we cut a hole through the brace. Now we can also use that arm cut for the next step. We're, let's cut the side. And so if I come over to brace, I'm going to activate brace. I'm going to hit the D key again to where you see it makes it transparent. I'm going to come back over to draw a curve again. And draw a curve, I'm going to come over I'm going to trace along the surface. And again, if you have problems finding the part, it's because I still have the brace activated. So I can actually toggle over and click on this and activate the arm. I'm going to show you a shortcut. If you hit the question mark key, you can roll over and select what object you want to activate. So question mark allows you to change the activated piece with a shortcut. Now I can feel the arm. And what I'm going to do is just draw a seam line down the edge. Use the H key to pan. And I'm just going to trace the anatomy. I can use the G key too, just to rotate around and... And the reason why I let I leave the the brace on is so I know how far to draw my curve here. And when you're done, you can hit end or the E key. And then if the graphics for the uh, translucent brace are a little intense, you can toggle back over to just the brace. and then hit D, and then hide it. So now we have that nice curve. Now, if you, if you struggle to draw it nice and clean, again, you can come over to the curve tools, just like we did before. Add points, add, change the tangency, move things around. So if you really wanted to move this, and remember, the inchworm is your friend as well. So you can turn on inchworm and manipulate the curves and move stuff around. And then make sure to turn that off when you're done. And then you can get out of the curve command itself. And there you go, you drew this curve down the edge. So now we're going to use what we call the ridge tool. And that is under detail clay right here. Detail clay, again, hold alt, drag it over here if you're gonna use it a lot. What this tool is, is what when I go into it, it will make a profile follow a curve almost like a sweep but where it's different from a sweep is the normal direction of the sweep follows the surface of the part that it is snapped to so in this instance we're going to use a square but you see you can use a circle square diamond you can create your own sketches and select them and make a sketch profile follow the surface of this mesh so what we're going to do is, in order to start using the command, you click on the curve itself, and whatever the default, whatever you ran last time, which you can see exactly what I did last time, is it's like we're creating a little Great Wall of China along the surface of the part. And you'll notice that the wall follows the normal direction of the shape. And you see why I'm using this is that I can create this thin wall and then use it to cut away from the brace. Now, I'll show you the settings for this as you click on the settings. You can change the thickness. That's the offset from the surface, the height. So if I just adjust it and make it 12 millimeters, you'll see that it adjusts higher. Or if I go down to 6 millimeters or 5 millimeters, 
eight millimeters. There we go. So I go really high on purpose just to exaggerate it so you can see it follow the shape. And then I you can you can make this even thinner if you want to. Right now it's one millimeter. But the issue with making it even thinner than one millimeter is you have to raise the resolution of the voxels high enough. Because if it's only one millimeter and I use half a millimeter voxels, then there's only two voxels. And what happens is you'll see it creates a mess where it doesn't create a nice accurate wall. So you have to raise the resolution up. So in this instance, I'm going to say 0.1 millimeter is what I use for my cutting piece and then hit create a new piece to make sure that pops up for you because yours may not be uh, set the same way. And then once you're done, you can hit create ridge and it creates a new ridge as a new piece with that resolution that I selected along the edge of the arm. So this ridge, this ridge, I made it as a new piece. So all I'm going to do now is come over and say Boolean, remove from, brace. And then you will see that now I can hide my ridge, hide my arm cut piece. It's just the tool body that I'm using and show the brace itself. So not the prettiest brace ever but I just cut a nice thin slice through it. There's lots of other things you can do here where you can create notching and all kinds of stuff. We're just getting started here, showing how to start off. Now you notice that when it offset, it's even got the imperfections in the anatomy that's showing up in the brace. So you could always do some hot wax smoothing and everything to the original anatomy before you start any of this. This tutorial is really just to show you the basics of getting started, but you could also you could smooth out some of the anatomy so that way it doesn't show up in the brace itself. Now for the final the final step, some companies will want to add their logo to it. So I like to use under detail clay this emboss area tool. Emboss area will allow you to use an image. So if I just click this checkerboard here and select our company logo, you can go into the patterns folder in the install directory here, and it shows you directly where it is. You can put your own logo in there. I can select my logo. Whatever is white is going to offset, and whatever is black is going to be zero. And what this tool does is allows you to, like, use this as a stamping tool where I can come over to the brace, zoom in, and you see that I don't have my brace activated right now. So I'm going to use the question mark key, click on brace, activate it. Now it is. Shrink down using the plus minus keys on the keyboard. And I clicked multiple times there. Now if I click I just stamped whatever is the blue is going to offset whatever value I set in here. So I could say offset 0.2, and I'm going to actually inset it. So it's going to carve it in. I'm going to say lower it, and then hit lower. You can actually hit preview first, so it'll show like what it looks like. So it's like, oh, that's not far enough. Maybe I want to do 0.3. A little more crisp there, maybe 0.4. Yeah, again, adjust it to where, where you want it. And then when you're ready, you can hit apply. And then it will apply that offset. So it just bakes in the logo into the surface of the part. And again, I'm using raster images. These are PLYs, OB, um, PNGs, bitmaps. Um, you can do all kinds of textures and patterns. So you can even pattern these along a curve and create all kinds of different artwork on the surface. You can create textures too and do like crinkle patterns on the surface of the part. All kinds of things you can do with this. Really helpful. I'm just using it to stamp our company logo in it.
but that shows you how this emboss works, this emboss area. So this is my basic brace demo where you can show how to create a brace for somebody's wrist, just manually offsetting and cutting the piece. And then now, if I wanted to, I could turn everything off and I could take this piece and just go ahead and export this as a STL PLY OBJ file and then go print it, print it on a 3D printer from there. So that's how you can 3D print or create your own brace from a 3D scan of anatomy. Hopefully this is helpful as a nice introduction. I know it's long-winded. I moved as fast as I could, but this is intended to be shared as an introduction from never using Freeform to actually going through some of these tutorials using the haptics. And then this will be a resource that I can send to people and have them follow along when they get their haptic at their own pace using my files in order to get started without having to do this manually over a meeting. Um, so I think basically I gave a, a nice tutorial on how to open the software, where all the buttons are. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to comment or send me emails. I'm happy to answer questions about the software. Thank you for your time and look for more tutorials and stuff on my channels.